Okay. Right. Let's um, let's pray and then we'll get started. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, we, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this time. We commit this session, Lord, into your mighty hands. Even as we, Lord, look at the beauty of your word, the wisdom in your word, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you'll give us the tools, Lord, to um, rightly divide it, interpret it rightly, Lord. Even as we revisit those things, God, Father, we pray that you will put it in our hearts, Master, so that our rightly dividing the word can lead to right learning, right revelation, and uh, right believing, and uh, right lifestyle, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last class, we looked at uh, the whole thing of uh, what preaching is, it means to proclaim, and we also looked at, uh, you know, even before we look at preaching, we need to uh, understand it to, in order to understand it, we need to understand the context in which it was written, right? to whom it was written, the culture in which it was written. In other words, we need to interpret it rightly. right? So we, uh, the whole study of interpretation of scripture, uh, I think we spent about a semester on it. right? So that's called hermeneutics. And so we're just doing a review of hermeneutics because it's very important for us to um, uh, you know, kind of rightly divide the word. And we looked at you know, several scriptures, Paul writing to Timothy and saying, you know, it's the, this is the importance of scripture. You need to uh, use it. You need to uh, teach it in the right way. Uh, it has to be the right doctrine. It has to be divided rightly. And the and the reason is that right teaching leads to our beliefs, affects our beliefs, influences our beliefs, and our beliefs, uh, you know, lead to how we live our life, how we connect, how we how, uh, what our convictions are how we live our life, meaning what we believe, what we choose to believe, what we choose not to believe, our decisions, everything right, anchors on this. And that's why Paul says over and over again, you do this, right? Um, so not only for himself, not only for Timothy, but also for others. He says, you, first of all, you know, give yourself to these doctrine. You, you know, give yourself to these so that your, your progress will be evident. And in doing so, others will also be saved. Others will also be touched. Okay, okay. So let's look at um, you know the. Let's continue. Uh, uh, we looked at how we need to interpret scripture grammatically, right? In grammatically meaning, you know, the language in which it is written, the translation in which we have. Well, it is written in very simple, um, most part of it. Uh, language and uh, if it's written directly what it means that it that, you know there's no other hidden meaning right we understand it the way it is written okay but also we saw that there could be places where there are figures of speech right idioms and phrases and figures of speech and symbolic uh, you know language and we need to you know know that we can't take it literally uh, and we need to interpret it rightly. Okay, so we looked at an example, right? Uh, where um, Luke chapter eleven about the if an earthly father, if a son asks earthly father, you know whether you know if he want a bread, if he wants bread, would a earthly father give him a stone? But then it goes on to talk about egg and you know uh, and so on. And so will a earthly father give egg or fish? Instead of that, will he give a scorpion or a serpent? And we, we see that the culture in which, the culture to which it was addressed, these things like scorpions and serpents were offensive. And so they could actually do that comparison and say, hey, you, earthly father won't give this. And what uh, earthly father will give something which is of less quality, something that is dangerous to the sun. Right? So we saw all that. So the context and the culture also matters so we need to understand that you know some of those problematic scriptures or you know pro problematic in the sense some of the difficult passages uh, we need to understand the culture it will help us give clarity okay so uh, the historical background on of the author and the recipients also uh, it it matters okay so the question we need to ask is what rather than what the how does it you know how does it speak to me or what does it um, mean to me, we need to understand what does it mean to the original audience, right? To those people to whom it was written at those times, that culture, what does it mean to them, right? 
So if we ask that question and some of these passages, you know, it really helps us. Okay. Um, we see in Genesis 15 this whole thing of cutting a covenant. Now, that is not something that we do, right? Have you ever when was the last time you cut a covenant with someone? You did not, right? I don't think in our lifetime, lifetimes, you know, we ever cut a covenant the way they did it. Right. And we read in Genesis 15 that how you know the Lord would Lord would go between those two parts of those animals, right? It was cut, literally cut into two, and then the Lord would pass through that. And we we see that whole passage writing about that. So, you know, so for us to understand that, right, what does it mean? It means we need to study that, you know, this is how a covenant was made in those days. Okay. So for us today, we think when we think of covenant, I think the, the closest uh, we, we think of that we can relate to is the marriage covenant, right? And how it is made with vows spoken to each other and how there could be some symbols that are exchanged. It could be a necklace, it could be a ring. Sometimes it, it's Bibles that are exchanged, etc. You know, for those who don't wear jewels and all that. So we understand hey, this is a covenant, this is a promise, um, and so on. But cutting a covenant, literally those days, when you see that passage, it means that this is how God did it, right? Um, Revelation 2 talks about, you know, how this place, uh, Asclepius, or, um, you know, uh, sorry, Pergamum, it was the worship of a deity, and Revelation 2 talks about the fact that I know, you know, this is the place where Satan's seat is, right? So this, it was a, it is a figurative thing. It was referring to the work of Satan. It was referring to this deity, uh, which was there, and it says it was the seat of Satan. So for us to understand, did Satan sit there? Well, it was actually a deity which was worshipped there. So this is referred to as this seat of uh, Satan, right? 1 Corinthians 11 about head covering and, <clears throat> and where it talks about how it is, uh, you know, it is shameful for a woman to um, leave her head uncovered and so on. Um, again, you know, it, it talks about a particular culture there where <clears throat> uh, it, it talks about Corinth, right? That uh, the, the place was Corinth. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And then uh, in Corinth, it was a very immoral lifestyle that was being led. In Corinth, there was a temple uh, for this deity where, you know, the worship was a very immoral worship, right? People were physically prostituting themselves and, and calling it worship. And in fact, these temple prostitutes, would you would know by their shaved head, right? So when we read... 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers and some of these people who were serving in these temples had come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, right? So he is saying, you know, he's writing to them and he's telling them, you know, um, uh, he's talking about head covering and and therefore he says in verse 6, you know, if uh, 11 and verse 6, if a, if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn for it is same shameful for a woman to be Shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Right. So, he, with that context, you know, the people were serving in this temple and they were identified by their shaved heads, um, women specifically. And, you know, he's, he's talking about that. So, we, we get a different perspective altogether, right? Maybe somebody is going through, you know, some kind of a medical condition and their you know, head is shaved or for, for some surgery, head is shaved. He's not saying it's shameful. He's not referring to that, right? He's referring to that culture where these people uh, worship this deity or goddess Aphrodite and in the temple where these women actually deities, they were, I'm sorry, were uh, uh, devotees, they actually shaved their heads. So he's referring to that, right? Okay. So when we look at it historically, we can understand. But this is how it was in that culture, and therefore he is writing this. Okay, and we also need to interpret it critically. We said first, you know, grammatically, historically, critically. Critically meaning that, uh, you know, it should make sense rationally. When we think about it, it should make sense. 
right? It can't, one line cannot contradict with the other line. So it should make sense. So which means critically unbiased manner, you, you see it, you read it. Don't put meaning, too much meaning into it, um, you know, or assign meaning into it, um, you know, without it making rational sense. Okay. Okay. So let's look at six practical rules that we can look at. Okay, for us to help, like a checklist, to help us, you know, to interpret it, right? Interpret a passage of scripture according to its context. Okay, so what does context mean? Anyone? A situation? Anyone? Text. Uh, explanation? Context means text. Context. The context in which something is spoken. The context in which something is said. Specific, something specific to a particular, uh, something specific to a particular event, right? Uh, let me just put this on the chat. Uh, the circumstances that form the setting for an event statement idea okay in terms of which it can be fully understood right so the which means that suppose you see a verse and uh, you know sometimes we take it and we need to understand what is the setting what is the context what is the surrounding in which it is written because if you take it out of context out of it and we interpret it just by that verse alone, then it becomes a problem, right? Even this, all the scriptures that we said just now, that we looked at, if you take it out of context, and if you build a you know theory or a, build a theology on it, then it can be very, it can be very dangerous because people can be misled, people can be hurt, and at the end of it, you're not honoring, you're not honoring or esteeming the word, you're not dividing the word correctly. Okay, so it's important that we look at the context. Okay, so what is that? Which testament? Okay, uh, if you're following in the notes, it's page five, right? Which testament? Which author? What time period? Okay, all that you look at it, and and that will give us the context. Okay, like uh, we've heard of people who have taken scripture out of context, and it becomes a heresy. Right? Heresy means it's something heretical, something not of the truth. And when something is not of the truth, it doesn't liberate. It brings people into bondage. Right? Because where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And the Spirit and the Word, they say, they, are, they, you know, they don't contradict. They go as one. Right? So, uh, like for example, um, you know, just, let me just see that, get that reference. Okay. Um, I think it's in one of the epistles. Sorry. Um, just one second. Uh, let me just get that reference. I think it's important that we look at that um, scripture, and and it you know it gives us a uh, understanding. If you look, take it out of context. You know, uh, it gives it completely different meaning. But if you consider it in context, um, then it it gives a different meaning, right? Okay. So we'll uh, the scripture that we are looking at is um, sorry, just one second. It's in Titus and chapter one, right? Okay. Let me just put it there. Titus chapter one, and let me just see which verse it is. Okay, Titus 1 and verse 15. Oops, sorry. Um, verse 15, right? Okay, so let's read it. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. It says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience are 
defiled. Okay, just consider that phrase. To the pure, all things are pure. Okay. Now, if you take that out of context, so what does that what does it mean? It means that those who are pure, everything that they think, say, and do, it is pure. Right. Now, if you take it and then you use it and say, okay, I have been justified, I've been washed by the blood of Jesus, I've been cleansed. So whatever I do, whether in thought, word, or deed, it is pure. So that is, so what am I saying? You know, hey, I'm saying something, I'm hitting somebody. It is pure. Why? Because I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. So the thing is, you might think, hey, that's so foolish. How can you even consider that? But there was a group, a cult, which used this scripture and said, you know, whatever way in which I evangelize, it does not matter. Because it is a pure method, right? I am pure by, I made pure, whatever method I use to evangelize, to share the gospel, uh, whatever way in which I bring people into this cult or into this group, it is fine. You know, it was, they started out well as people who actually were passionate for the Lord and so on. But this, these kind of things, these kind of teachings, right? To the pure, all things are pure, which means that, you know, they you would use any method, which means that if I say a lie, in order to bring you to that cult or place, right, to that group, to be part of that group, they would say it is fine. Why? Because, you know, I've been made pure and whatever I do is pure. Plus, it is a noble act. What is a noble act? I'm bringing you, I'm saving you from the world. I'm bringing you into this, yeah, into this activity. But if you look at the context, what does it say, right? If you look at context, He's talking about, Paul is talking about some people who are idle, talkers, deceivers. You know, you look at verse 10. Especially some of the Jewish origin is saying, you know, their mouths must be stopped to subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, right? And then he says, you know, rebuke them sharply. They should be sound in the faith. They should not be listening to Jewish fables and uh, and commandments of men who turn from the truth, you know, and then he goes on to say, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, even their mind and conscience are defiled. Okay, so he's saying, okay, you know, there are these who are following the Lord, and what proceeds from them is, is pure things, is good things, their mind is not defiled, their conscience is not defiled, right? So if somebody's mind and conscience are defiled and you're continuing to say to the pure, all things are pure, then that's a subversion of truth, right? It is not truth. You're not in truth anymore. But unfortunately, you know, this cult, it was very, you know, it was very popular sometimes in the 80s and 90s. They were very active and a lot of children were there and, you know, but, um, you know, it was a cult, right? They used to go and, by whatever means, you know, they would share the gospel and, you know, gospel is as in, you know, what they thought was the gospel and bring them into the cult, right? So, so heretical views, heretical, you know, theologies, um, you know, proceed when we take things out of context, you know. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing, right? Study the context, find out, right? Because a context brings boundaries. It says, okay, this is what it means. It doesn't mean something out of that, right? So it helps us, it's helpful. Okay. Also, interpret in the light of progressive revelation. Okay, so what does that mean? We see that, well, God is a holy God, but man, for man, you know, God is infinite in his wisdom and so on, but man is finite, and this whole understanding of God, this whole understanding of the gospel, understanding of redemption and God's ways and thoughts, we see it unfolding in scripture. It's progressive manner, right? So, well, the Old Testament saints, they did not fully grasp about salvation. Right? Salvation by grace through faith. They did not fully grasp it. They know, okay, it's a shadow of things, you know, kind of some, some of the, the sacrifices they made, right? At the tabernacle, 
or that Moses built and also you know in the temple those sacrifices well that was the understanding that yes when I do this God forgives my sin and when I do this God you know hears me my sin is covered I'm able to commune with God right so that was the understanding now that revelation of sal salvation that revelation of being cleansed from our sins right that was progressive right and you know when we look at the dispensation of the cross after the you know after the time of the cross we see that there is a fullness of that understanding fullness of the understanding of okay this is what that was referring to like hebrews talks about that you know all those you know for if there was sacrifice which would take away the sin well what why was there a need for more and more why was there a need for repeated sacrifice right so he the writer of hebrews he's talking to those jewish audience and he's saying hey, there needed to be a perfect sacrifice and that was jesus well did when god did institute that why till the time that perfect sacrifice was made and now there is no more requirement for any other sacrifice right it was a progressive revelation progressive understanding right uh, similarly you know animal sacrifices and so on what we see in hebrews 8 several things like you know polygamy right it was it was not condoned in the sense it was not you know it was not said that it was sin in the old testament but it is very much taught against in the new testament Right? the holiness of god the, the 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 understanding of marriage and everything it is well it is taught against right so just because they had multiple you know spouses or wives doesn't mean that for the new testament you know saying it applies you know it's saying oh it's there in the bible and right? it is there in the bible it was it was permitted in the bible god allowed it therefore it is so even now now no that is the that is wrong understanding right because in the light of progressive revelation as we journey through that you see that yes it was you know there but then that does not mean that god allowed it or con or you know condoned it meaning he was all for it no we see that you know it is very clearly in all these epistles we see the um, the god standard for it god's heart for you know marriage how it should be and so on so like this you know there are several things so we uh, we need to look at it in the light of progressive right now the third thing would be okay if something is unclear okay there are there, there could be some things that are not clear right but don't build a teaching or a doctrine on an unclear passage right there needs to be clarity look at that unclear passage based on what is clear what is you know uh, what is steadfast what is proclaimed without any shadow of doubt look at it for example 1 Corinthians 15 29 okay 1 Corinthians 15 29 it says uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 Paul writes about baptism and he writes about baptism a practice of baptism that was that was there which was there given for the dead, which means some people had died and before their death, they were not baptized. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. So there was pa this practice in society that people were taking baptism on behalf of those who were already dead and gone. Okay, so because it's mentioned in scripture, like there was this belief that, yeah, even for those who are dead, who did not believe in Christ, who uh, you know who were not baptized, you know, a person who is living can do it on their behalf, right? So, well, several uh, you know uh, groups of people started doing that. You know, so let's look at one Corinthians fifteen, right? One Corinthians fifteen, and I think it's verse uh, twenty nine, right? Okay, twenty nine. What is he writing about? He's talking about Christ being risen from the dead. He okay, was 20 onwards and how he's the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. Okay? And what he's addressing is, is this whole thing of the people were saying 
that there is no rising again from the dead there is no resurrection okay so that is what he is saying um verse 12 1 corinthians 15 and verse 12 he asks a question you know if you look at verse 12 1 corinthians 15 he asks a question if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead okay so he's uh, in fact the whole chapter right from the beginning he's talking about how jesus was raised from the dead and how there were many who saw that there were first uh, like what he call it first account first witness accounts of those who saw him raised from the dead he was seen by you know peter he was seen by the 12 he was seen by 500 etc and then so he's saying you know how can you say that there is no resurrection from the dead so which means in the church in corinth there were some people saying there's no resurrection if we die we die that's it right so that was some of the things that was there in popular culture you know this is one life we live if we die there is no you know there's nothing beyond that so however we you live might as well live right so which means the way to live life is either pleasure or whatever it doesn't matter because at the time of death everything ends right so that was creeping into the church as well so he writes to them he says you know uh, and then he, you know he says in verse 29 otherwise what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why then are being baptized are they being baptized for the dead so he's referring to a a practice which was uh, which was not correct there was some practice happening okay uh, an erroneous practice where there was some baptism given on behalf of those who were already dead so he's he's referring to that he's making a reference to that in saying okay you see that is happening and if they believe that you know there's no rising from the dead why are they doing it they're doing this you know why are they doing it they also believe that there is a rising up from the dead and that's why they are doing it you know but it's he it doesn't say that it is a correct practice so what happened was based on this verse 1529 he said hey you can actually do something people who are maybe sinful and who did not believe in jesus who died you can actually do something here maybe good works maybe certain things and that will gain for them some points or you know and this whole teaching of purgatory there is a middle ground heaven hell there's a intermediate place called purgatory where if you do as a maybe as a relative or as a if you dump, do something for them pray to the saints for them do something for them then there is a chance that instead of going to hell they will go to heaven okay. so you know this whole concept you no know, this whole teaching of purgatory is that there is a middle ground right so there is a we we read in scripture that when in a person is absent from the body is present with the lord right or his destiny you know based on his belief those who are asleep in christ are with the lord is what scripture says so so this whole thought of this whole idea of a middle ground where a person who is dead goes to this middle ground or what is called as purgatory and based on the good works or good things that are done on their behalf because now they can't do anything but on their behalf people on earth maybe their family maybe their whatever who they were close to they do it on their behalf they pray to the saints on their behalf they do good works on their behalf and therefore that somehow that affects their destiny the final destiny or whether they will go to heaven or go to hell so this was this teaching was there so what were some of the fundamental foundational beliefs for that it was this right where baptism is given on behalf of those who are already dead why is baptism given as a sign of you accepting christ as a sign of you receiving new life but here it's given so that it will somehow affect the the one who is already gone the false practice it's a false practice right so it's a false practice giving rise to false ideas and false theology uh, heretical theology so uh, but then surprisingly the you know during the dark ages the church caught on 
right and the whole practice of indulgences right even for act of sin and all that um it was support it was supported right the church supported it the church had fallen to such a extent right <clears throat> okay and the, uh, yeah luke 169 talks about you know indulgences and how that whole practice of indulgences was based on this particular verse right uh, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when they fail uh, they may receive you into an everlasting home okay so uh, this whole thought of you know what indulgences is right so you pay something to the church so that whatever sin you do is actually covered for it's like a license right um and then it affects your it it doesn't affect your whatever destiny because it's taken care of in anyway so um to so paul didn't refer to that when we study it in context we see that uh, so if something is not clear look at it from the point of what is clear the bible talks about okay the certainty of death but certainty of resurrection and also the certainty that you know whatever you do when you're alive that is what matters right you cannot do anything to you know to or you should not do anything to reach out to the dead or you know reach out to the spirits or you know bible strictly forbids us to do that right okay then the other thing um, the you know last two things that we can look at is that interpret the spirit of the passage and not necessarily the letter okay uh, one extreme example that we can look at is matthew 7 verse 5 where the lord says you know first remove the plank from your own eye then you will see cl sorry clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye okay so so what is the heart behind that passage the lord is saying first you know you remove your faults whatever you know you have against your brother or whatever you have against the lord you know don't be hypocritical don't kind of excuse that and say okay no no but actually he has a bigger sin or she has the bigger you know uh, fault and therefore you know let me be uh, you know let me help or let me talk about that fault and not about you know just uh, neglect mine so the, here the lord is saying you know you remove the plank and he's using figures of speech right uh, i think what is what you would call as even a hyperbole which means that it is like a it's like an exaggeration you know is it possible to have a plank in your eye what is a plank that bench table that table that you have that's a plank that wooden thing it's a plank right so is it possible to have a plank in your eye in your eyes no is it possible to have a speck in your eye dust yes possible and you say no okay just blow i think there's something in my i just blow it out and i say okay blow it is it it's possible to have a speck some dust in your eye yeah it's possible but it's not possible to have something like this in your eye right but the lord is saying you know what you have is like this the size of that is like a plank like your own shortcoming you know your own faults are like a big plank but you want to remove that small speck from your brother's eye from your neighbor you know you want to remove that small speck you are excusing that plank which is in you so he's saying the lord is saying first remove that so he's using an exaggeration to you know to talk about the bigness of the things that you are excusing yourself so you know so that's the heart behind the message that the lord is conveying but he's using these figures of speech in order to convey that so understand that right okay then <clears throat> yes we interpret with our dependence upon god's spirit right we depend on the holy spirit we don't use our own human understanding uh, we don't use merely our our experience in life right we don't use merely our learning well all that is good all that is good but we don't stop just with that right we depend on the holy spirit and that's the beautiful part because all scripture is god breathed right inspired by the holy spirit it says that you know men of god wrote as they were moved by the holy spirit which means as they were inspired led prompted by the holy spirit they wrote down the scripture so 
since the Holy Spirit was very much involved in the writing of it, when we are trying to decipher and understand what he had, you know, inspired to write, why can't we depend on him? Right? Why can't he involve him in the process and say, come Holy Spirit, we invite you. I'm, you know, I'm reading your word. Please help me understand. Please help me to, you know, understand it correctly so that I can teach it rightly or I can, you know, I can follow it correctly. Okay. John 16, verse 13, the Lord Jesus said this, you know, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. First of all, he's saying he's called the spirit of truth, right? He is holy. He's called the spirit of truth. Okay. He will guide you into all truth. So he does the work of guiding the child of God into all truth, right? He will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come as well. Okay. So the word of God also says the spirit and the bride, you know, spirit and the word, these are one. Right. So he's not going to contradict. As long as you are sure that hey, I'm depending on the Holy Spirit, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit, and he's the one who is teaching he's the one who is leading me right and the beautiful thing is, is this when we rely on the holy spirit to interpret portions or difficult things in scripture he's going to lead us back to the word right he's going to lead us back to the word back to certain sections in the word back to certain things which actually give clarity right which integrate the whole thing which give clarity he's going to eliminate the word further, but he's also going to lead us back to the word. So we see that um, there's a lot of clarity. And, and this is the thing. He will guide us into all truth. Right? So there's great assurance. right? You don't, you don't have to try and figure it out yourself. He will guide us into all truth. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll just come to the end of this, um, you know, this uh, chapter on... Uh, Rightly dividing, interpreting, okay, and it, uh, it's just a review of what you've already learned. Okay, so let's uh, let's just start off. We have since we have some time, let's just start off with chapter two, and uh, and look at it. What is this whole thing? You know, this strange word homiletics. What does it mean? Okay, it comes from, you know, it, it's made up of of this homily, which means discourse or conversation, right? And uh, homos is a saying, and homilos means an assembly or a crowd. Okay, so homiletics is the science and art of preaching, okay. communicating the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, uh, because you know we we call it it's an it's a science. We call it as an art because it involves certain processes, right, of preparation, um, of explanation, of also considering. Okay, is it making sense? Right, uh, and can I can I say it differently so that it helps? Right, all that is. All, so there is a kind of human e effort involved, and that is why we call it. You know, it's the science of preaching, right? And uh, it's also the art of preaching because you can be creative in it, right? You can be creative. There's no set way. You can be creative in it, and we're going to look at some of that. Okay, so Saint Augustine one of the early church fathers, he's supposed to have really or introduced these terms, you know, like homilia and sermo, you know, from which we get the word sermon, right? Um, introduced into the Latin, you know, speaking church community, and uh, from which we get the word preaching and sermon and so on, right? Okay. Look at some basics of communication. Okay. Uh, is this clear, right? Any Any questions based on what we looked at so far. No, this is just a quick review, right? Um, an in-depth uh, you know, study of hermeneutics was already done. and But the, anyway, the videos would be there and also the notes would be there. So yeah, you can always refer to that, right? Okay. Okay, so let's look at you know some of the basics of communication, okay? Now, when, it, when you look at communication, okay, what does that mean? If you want to communicate something, there, or we say there is good communication that's happening, 
what does that mean communicate what does that word mean you're convey you're expressing right and a thought an idea right now communication also means you're receiving communication is two way right it's not just i trying to transmit something but it also means that the one who is receiving my message is also sending back it could be a verbal non verbal some message right so if you look at communication there are basic three elements to it three parts to it one is the sender who is sending the message the message itself the second part third one is the receiver who is receiving the message right so it could be sir, when you say sender it could be the person who's preaching person who's sharing the message itself the you know the the, con uh, the content what he's sharing and then the receiver you know, it could be the person who's receiving the message person who's listening it could be a student it could be a classroom it could be a congregation whoever you know that's the receiver okay now the communication process obviously begins with the the sender and also you know the heart and mind of the sender you know he or she is the one who is it starts there right there right uh, we are looking at communication in general right uh, basic communication right so we're not talking about you know specifically about spiritual matters or communication in general right so it will apply to everything okay so different methods are used by the sender to send a message right certain uh, we i we read about this you know some of these um what we call as um what we wrongfully say as red indians right in in the in the america uh, they were actually uh, they were actually the name given was a mistake columbus christopher columbus went there he thought it was india okay and then he called them indians so that's how the native americans are called indians and some of the sh shade of their skin seem to be reddish so they are called red indians and so on so yeah let's say you know native in native americans right they used smoke signals to convey right from one hill to another hill right they would use blank blankets to you know just hold on to that smoke release that smoke and smoke signals right so they they use different methods smoke signals maybe even uh, you know the sound of birds and i recently you know uh, watched a video where you know it's a it's a tribe in africa and they use you know whistles and clicks and you know noises like that parts of the it's part of the language you know to communicate okay so we could you know in our modern days we could use different method different methods you know what are some methods that we use you know we use digital you know like electronic emails we use texts uh, right to communicate we speak right we sing we we write letters we write poems and write songs and these are all methods in order to communicate something right send something send a message right so in sending message in using different methods to communicate there could be different barriers or several barriers barriers means blocks blocks to communicate so how many of you have played that uh, game called chinese whispers right you okay you stand in a circle or sit in a circle and you say something whisper something in the ears of the person then that person whispers to the other person and then it just goes around it's something complex usually and so by the time it goes around and comes to an end right the message is completely different or it could it is not the same as what the first person shared i'm sure you would have seen some reels about um, you know this particular game that people played right everybody standing in a row standing in a line they are facing let's say standing in a line facing the wall okay everybody is facing this side except the first person the first person you know let's say vimal he he's looking at me and i'm showing him some action okay the action i'm showing him is like maybe like that okay so then vimal turns the other person behind vimal he turns and vimal shows him that action okay so only one person sees it at a time so vimal sees it and maybe uh, after that is uh, uh, so sugan 
So he turns and Vimal shows him. So Vimal, when he's showing it, he does it in his style, right? So I do it specifically like this. For Vimal, it's just, okay, I need to salute. So Vimal does it like this, for example, <laughs> right? And for him, he wants to do it very stylistically. So maybe like, like a movie star, like Rajni Khan. <laughs> so he does it like that. <laughs> and on and on it goes till the last person. So you see that this has probably changed to this by the end of it. Why? You know, because of certain barriers, miscommunication, right? So it happens. So why are we looking at it when it comes to preaching? You say something, yeah. 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 So styles of communication also either enhance communication or it could hinder. It can, you know, disrupt communication. So we need to be careful, you know, in what way, who is our audience? So those are kind of things, right? So several barriers, you know, some barriers could be, um, we'll pick it up next class, but some barriers could be our language itself, right? So when my language is not understood by the other, then it becomes a problem. People can actually misunderstand. Well, let's say the person understands my language, but if I have poor language, then also poor language meaning, you know, I say certain words differently, I don't use proper grammar, then the person who understands is unable to understand or understands it differently and so on. So we look at, uh, you know, several barriers there are to communication. We are studying it because we're talking about proclaiming God's word, preaching. God's word, right? So we need to be good in, I mean, we need to be clear and we need to make sure that we communicate well, right? Okay, so we'll stop here and then we'll uh, continue next class, right? Thank you. God bless.